So while in Florida, his family has him committed to the mental institution. It goes on to say that during that 15 years stay, he would eventually file a lawsuit. And he claimed that it robbed him of his constitutional rights since he was confined against his will. Donaldson won the case, including monetary damages, in the United States District Court, which affirmed, which was uh, affirmed by the United States Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit. 1975, the United States Supreme Court agreed that Donaldson had been improperly confined, but uh, vaca uh, vacated the award of damages on uh, the Fifth Circuit ordered that a new trial on damages be held. So they kept the damages out of it, but the Supreme Court held that having Donaldson there beyond his free will was against his constitutional rights. Well, what did, would this do? It would open the floodgates to mental institutions all over the United States and they will be set free. They were allowed to go, roam around the cities. Most of them were homeless. Some of them would go back to their families and shortly later get thrown out because of their psychotic behavior. And there was nothing in place in 1975 after that court ruling. So what it did, it forced law enforcement to deal with these individuals and police could only bring them to the system that can't say no. And that system would be jails and prisons all around America. All right. So that gives us a little bit of a background on the global view of mental illness, right? So now, 1989, right? Remember, we said that this case was in 1975. Floodgates were open. Over a decade later, in 1989, the first police department to chart, start organizing crisis intervention training is going to be Memphis, Tennessee. So the Memphis model was created in 1989 after an incident that occurred where police ended up shooting a mentally ill individual. The community was outraged by what had happened, and they demanded that the police have different tactics in dealing with people that were mentally ill. Thus, the Memphis model was created. Now, the Memphis model would go out and all the agencies in America would jump onto it. It was slow in rolling out to each one, remembering that there are 18,000 police departments in America. But by and large, everybody embraced it. They really didn't change much of the curriculum. The Memphis model dealt with police how to deal with the mentally ill, how to communicate with them, how to posture, how their body posture should, should be based on their training. Let me repeat that. Based on their training. You see, when I was in crisis intervention in law enforcement, we had some of these kooks that were not in law enforcement that wanted to teach us against what we learned in the academy in defensive posturing for defensive tactics. Well, we could not take what we learned in the academy and throw it out the window because we weren't social workers. So we had to incorporate what they were teaching us in our tool chest, but primarily we had to keep what we learned at the police academy. So those were the challenges that a lot of agencies would find out. Remember, this is police. The contact with these individuals would be short-term. 
Uh, I'm not going to give a specific amount of time. It wasn't 10 minutes. But it could have been an hour. It could have been three hours. But it was short. And they would have a plan based on their agency where they would go with the individual. Most of them didn't have anywhere to go but jail. Now, they may have made an entry on their police or arrest report saying that the individual appeared to be mentally ill, and some jurisdictions had courts that were set up for the mentally ill, depending, again, on location. Some areas mixed everybody, apples and oranges all, all were mixed together. So, this a federal court ruling in 1975 created a can of worms for law enforcement. But these two evolutions of, of law enforcement would deal with this differently. Police under the Memphis model started organizing the short-term contact the police would have with the mentally ill. The skill set would get better as they learned. Some officers were better at it than others, of course. Some agencies were better at it than others as well. But the credit has always been given to the Memphis model of giving all agencies a platform where they would launch out from. You learn things about distance, you learn things about communication, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the methods that I would teach is never refer to somebody by what you think is their name. So let's say the guy says, my name is Harold. Or somebody, to somebody tells you his name is Harold. You should not approach him and call him Harold. Because although this might be his real name, it might trigger his past. Maybe his parents or his father that beat him would call him by his birth name, Harold, before this event. So you want the individual, as you approach him, the first point of contact is to ask him, my name is so-and-so, and you will present yourself first. What's your name? And there's the Mutual respect. Now, if he says, my name's Spider-Man, then he's Spider-Man during the conversation. One thing you should not do is play into his delusion. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is a temporary approach to dealing with the mentally ill. Agencies, depending on their locations and what resources they had, will have a plan. In doing this, I studied or did research on two agencies. Specifically, I went to the Tree Hugger State of California, and I looked at the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Agency. Excuse me. Because both of them are going to deal with the two different ones. One, now, of course, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department actually does policing and the jails or corrections, where Los Angeles PD does policing. But specifically for, for this purposes of this podcast, I looked at how the Los Angeles Police Department dealt with the policing aspect and how the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department dealt with the correctional aspect of it. And they were both quite different. All right, so... In dealing with, I'll give you a quick overview. I'm not even going to get into the weeds and reading it. But in dealing with the uh, Los Angeles Police Department had, uh, as of this time frame, 2024, over four decades, they've had resources where they could bring an individual and have that individual dealt with their psychotic behavior before they would process them 
in the criminal justice system. They had social workers, therapists, whatever you want to call them, because I really, uh, what, what I read was a little vague on what their titles were when they first started 40 years ago and what they are today. But it worked for them. Now, eventually, these individuals would be shifted over to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department for housing. This, in, this entity would deal with it differently. What would be the difference? Well, the Sheriff's Office had to do that permanent housing, care, custody, control. And they have an outdated jail system, which... I believe is somewhere in the 65, 70 years old, and they would get in trouble with the Justice Department, which claimed that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department was mistreating mentally ill prisoners or inmates in their jail facilities. And as a result, the federal government sued the County of Los Angeles for better treatment of the mentally ill. The Sheriff's Department would have to create a curriculum on training for its deputies, and it would have to be very detailed. One of the areas that they looked at for that detailed research was Miami-Dade, and a lot of that stuff that they looked at was the stuff I wrote, and I did for Miami did. So they obviously the sheriff's office in Los Angeles took their own road in how they're going to deal with this. I'm sure they spent a lot of money and resources that Miami Day did not uh, because the pockets were deeper in Los Angeles. But the outcome has to be the same. Better treatment. Now, again, the system that can't say no, and the system that doesn't know where they should go. Everybody knows in the criminal justice system that mentally ill people stay three times longer than normal people in the court system. So their cases have to now be determined by a psychiatrist that during the time of the commission of their crime, were they psychotic or not. That costs money resources, and a lot of time. So them being housed in a correctional facility means that much more because they're going to be there three times there, three times longer than a regular inmate. And it's going to cost a lot more. Psychotropic medications are going to be administered. and You have to have a lot of psychiatrists. I believe the at the time I worked, the, the standard was for every 100 inmates, one psychiatrist. Do the math on that. So if your institution has eight, nine, a thousand, two thousand people that are psychotic, psychotic is going to be defined as they're taking psychotropic medication. You would need a psychiatrist for every 100. Now, could they afford that? No, the answer is no. None of these agencies were built for this. They were built to fight crime. Now, all of a sudden, they're thrown into uh, the health industry, which is very expensive and costly. So I'm trying to give you a global overview of the rough start in 1989, the things that were speed bumps in the road to where we are going today. So... We look at the old crisis intervention, right? So the officer, we go back to the police, they arrive to the scene, they deal with the individual, they determine what crime, if any, they've committed, if it's a felony or it's a misdemeanor, depending on their jurisdiction, they're allowed, or their state, they're allowed to deal with this differently. Um, but they either have resources that they can go to pre-trial or they don't. 
In many, many jurisdictions, they didn't. It was jail, and that was it. So now we have to set up the court system, too, right? So we, we talked about the police, their short, temporary custody of mentally ill individuals, the care that they're trying to do for them, and how is they start presenting them into the criminal justice system. And corrections that has the permanent care of them, which is care, custody, and control, based on their charges, not their mental illness. But since they're mentally ill, they're responsible for the care. That means they have to have psychiatrists and psychotropic medication to deal with them while they're there. So the third element that we're going to set up now is going to be the court system. So a lot of jurisdictions created uh, mentally ill court systems, right? So the judge was really in tune to what was going on with the mental Ill, mentally ill community, and the state attorneys were kind of clued into the public defender and so forth. So the system was basically built to defer their criminal charges if they could show that they were psychotic at the time of the crime and get them on the track to become productive citizens, if possible. In lieu, while they were going through this process, the court system would either defer their criminal charges or get rid of them, depending how severe they were. So that was the criminal aspect of it. We're not going to dive into that anymore because it depends what state you're in, what laws they have. Some are more liberal than others. But the overall picture was to deal and help these individuals. And if they could get them out of their system and give, make them productive citizens, they would. If they can't, then there would be housed permanently in prisons, which have to deal with them even longer based on a sentence. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, life in prison. They're still psychotic. You still got to deal with them. They're not going anywhere. Get it? So it becomes much more complicated. All right. So we spoke about that. In Florida, they have this thing called the Baker Act, where a police officer deals with somebody mentally ill off the street. They don't need a psychiatrist or a licensed social worker to commit them. The officer can do it on his own for a short period of about three days, takes them to mental um, facility, such as a hospital that might deal with these uh, individuals, Baker acts them, and uh, they're there for three days, and uh, then there's a report that's either let them go or they send them off to the jail system. But different states have different laws and how they deal with this issue differently. We know that this, since 1975, has been a bag of, of tricks here as we started examining where we are today. So we looked at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and how they have now a lawsuit by the Justice Department. It's called CREPA, and they are being charged for civil rights abuses, and they have to increase better living conditions for mentally ill in the Los Angeles County Jail. They have to come create a training program and train these officers so there's a different type of outcome dealing with the mentally ill. Costly, timely, and sometimes it has hiccups. Nothing works perfectly in the mentally ill world. So here's another shocker to a lot of people out there, especially if you don't know much about what I'm talking about. It is tremendously expensive. Medication is three or four times more than the average medication for a prisoner. Psychiatrists cost a lot of money, and they are health professionals, and they demand, and they also get high salaries. So 
then you have a ratio of 100 prisoners or inmates to a psychiatrist. A lot of jurisdictions could not meet that. So they might have 500, let's hypothetical jail system, might have 500 inmates that are mentally ill and one psychiatrist. And they work nine to five, Monday through Friday. So any psychotic episodes after that, well, you might be talking to just a regular LPN nurse. So see how complicated it gets, costly, and the last part of what we're going to look at the jail system is they commit suicide. You can't stop it. A lot of these individuals have suicide ideation in their heads. One of the questions that a psychiatrist is going to ask them is, have you ever thought about killing yourself? And they say yes. He'll or she will ask, how? What's your plan? Now, they're not asking, asking the plan because they're psychotic themselves, even though some... But they want the individual to hear their own plan that's been in their head. They've never heard it before. Another issue that I want to touch on in the jail and prison society with mentally ill, there's something called the cluster effect. The cluster effect is when a person that suffers from mental illness carries out a successful suicide. As a result, other prisoners or inmates that have mental illness want to do the same escape that that prisoner or that inmate did, and they'll try to commit suicide too. It's called the cluster effect. It's one after another. Now, believe it or not, you might not think this is normal, and it's not. But it gives you an idea of what world you're going into. Some mentally ill people that have suicide ideation are considering taking their lives. Not because they see themselves as dying. They don't see that. They see that as a punishment to others, maybe their family. See, look what you did now. And they could see them crying over them in a funeral. But they don't necessarily see themselves as dead. Crazy? Well, that's why we're talking about this. So dealing with the mentally ill... Whether it's out in the street, or in the jail system, or prison system, is very complex, very detailed, very expensive. Tremendous amount of patience is needed. And you have to have a system that has a buy-in to what's being done. Because if you don't, you're spinning on your wheels. So... Let's see where we're going in the future in the new crisis intervention. If done right, this could be pretty good. The second evolution that they're doing to the Memphis model originated in 1989. And now what they're doing is officers, let's say, it's a misdemeanor offense that they believe might have happened. Uh, let's just say family calls you, a hypothetical, and they said, uh, my family member broke some dishes in the kitchen. They're having an episode. And we're not really towards a criminal event here other than it might turn into one. So they might deal with that over the phone with a social worker or a licensed social worker that might be able to defuse the situation. Some jurisdictions are actually getting in a car with the police and driving to the location. The police make the area safe, make sure there's no weaponry or anything, and allow the mental health professional to deal with the person. Either or, depending on the jurisdiction, 
This new program is identifying resources. Now, early on, when I first heard about this, I said, this is not a good thing. But as I started listening more to the plan, I started to do more buy-in. When I read the 40 decades, or four decades, or 40 years that the Los Angeles Police Department has networked, this is similar to the pilot program that the nation is trying to do now. It takes that liability, it takes that responsibility off law enforcement. You see, cops became cops because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to police. They wanted to work at the jails. They wanted to work at the prison. They necessarily didn't want to play psychiatrists. Yes, it was a part of their role and their law enforcement role. But that wasn't their initial understanding of what they were getting involved in. So what it did was it made it more difficult for law enforcement because there was a lot of things that could go wrong. There's a lot of other things that we could talk about where we don't have that time. And one of them is excited delirium where some of these people become more and more psychotic, super strength, their body heats up and they die. We'll have a show on that. I might have done one in the past, but it gets worse when you deal with the mentally ill. So imagine, I'll wrap it up with this. We're going to go back to the correctional facility where there's permanent housing. Remember, we talked about it, different from policing and CIT, which is a temporary thing. In the permanent housing, imagine housing a schizophrenic together with a person that's bipolar or manic depressive. And the bipolar is just yapping away at 400 miles an hour, hasn't slept in three days, and is pure manic while the schizophrenic house with him is doing what schizophrenics do. That, my friends, is the perfect storm. So, I think this plan might work. I think it works well what they've been doing in the correctional side, together with the court side. Now, police having the second evolution of the Memphis model, you can combine them both. It's a lot of patience, understanding, money, as I explained. But I think it is a good idea. You can't always blame things on the cops. Some of these individuals have been neglected for a long, long time in their lives. Society has kicked them from side to side, left to right. Since 1975 that the court system said it was unconstitutional to house them in a mental health institute, it became everybody's problem. And the system that can't say no has to deal with them, both out in the street and in jails and in prisons. Unfortunately, and as crazy as it sounds, a lot of health facilities have the option to opt out. No, we're not taking them. He's too crazy. But for many, many years, law enforcement never had that option. This may be the time for them to have the option. Up next, part of our wellness program, we're going to look at Cara, Cara. Deficiency of calories, okay? That is episode 219, October 2nd. It's a way of part of our wellness program. We're going to look at dieting, how to, to get into that deficit of calories and how that helps you in fasting and reducing your weight. Not an easy thing in the beginning. 
but if you really get into it, it works. So that's up next, and that's going to be episode 319. I also want to remind you, before we get off, we've uh, been going pretty good, 54 minutes. I want to remind you of Pistol Pete, the gunsmith down in Miami. If you have any issues with your guns and you look for a good gunsmith, use the one I used for many, many years when I was in law enforcement. Pistol Pete, the gunsmith, he's down in Miami. His information is down in the show notes. Uh, Sepio Vildia, Inc., with my friend Karis up in New Jersey. His information is also down in the uh, show notes. He's teaching people up in New Jersey carrying concealed. Do you believe it? In 2024, the good people of New Jersey finally can carry a gun on their person. God, never thought that would happen. And Triple A, that's AAA Gun Safety with uh, my good friend Amalo down in Miami, South Florida. If you're looking for training, highly recommend. And he's down there in the uh, Miami, South Florida area. His information is on the show notes. And also, Oasis Creations LV on Instagram. Check it out. It's for that wellness. Not everything is guns, 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 people. Well, it really is but for me, but... We also need the wellness aspect of it. So check out uh, Oasis Creations LV on Instagram. As always, continue to pray for yourself because without you, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, for your police agencies that serve you, and most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike. I'll see you downrange.